So I'm going to tell a joke over at the other church on uh, Bike Sunday. And uh, so these two priests on the back of a motorcycle riding this bike, and uh, they're going like 120 miles an hour. And so this cop pulls them over and says, Father, he says, uh, boy, you're kind of speeding there. I might have to write a ticket, but you know, I might let you off with a warning. He says, aren't you scared, you know, that uh, you might have an accident and both of you get killed? And the priest goes, of course not, son. He said, there's the Lord's with us. He says, well, I'm going to have to write a ticket now because you're not allowed to have three in a bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> well, apparently it's spring. <laughs> you noticed? <laughs> Seems to come and go, you know. We put this sign, we have this sign up outside, outside the little branch house that says spring, and I took it down last week because I thought it was false advertising. <laughs> uh, but somebody put it back up again. It's probably more a statement of faith than anything else. Um, but we just went through Easter, and this is a time of, of, of hope, a hope for a, a change. Uh, spring and Easter, you know, simultaneously, at a time that we look together for a change in the weather. We're looking for warmer days, plants re-emerging from their winter habitation, hibernation, hope for planting for a new crop, new season. And for the believer in Christ, we, we talked about the hope of the resurrection, and the hope of eternal life. We talked about the hope of his return, the blessed hope the Bible talks about. Home, hope for a home in heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, so we have a hope about that. Uh, but not everyone shares that kind of hope. Uh, as you know, there are some folks that... Uh, uh, see a half-filled glass, uh, some a half-empty glass, and some folks see nothing in the glass at all. Ever, know, ever been with those kind of folks, you know? Uh, boy. <clears throat> uh, you know, people are get, I think people are getting more and more pessimistic about hope. You notice that in the news? I mean, hope seems to be on the decline as we see, you know, just the emergence of all these, all this craziness in America these days that people are, I think, losing hope. People are losing hope in the church. I mean, if you listen to some of the statistics about the mainline churches, not the, not the uh, independent evangelical bunch, but, but churches like the UCC, the Methodists, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, attendance is doing this, it's a nosedive. <coughs> because I think people have lost uh, the relevance of Christianity, excuse me. So people are getting increasingly pessimistic, um, and their 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 hope is things like this: I hope that, I hope that, uh, I hope that I can pay my bills, so I don't get sick. Um, I hope this relationship will last. I hope um, the boss won't fire me, and on and on and on. And so those kind of hope hopes are not very hopeful, if you know what I mean. A little girl was once asked to define hope, and this is what she said. Um, hope is asking for something you know you're not going to get. <laughs> it's sad, but for a lot of people it's true. Um, you know, we used to have a, an old joke in, in pastoral circles that when somebody tells you, um, I'll think about it, I'll pray about it, and I'll get back to you, means they're never going to do it. So if anyone ever says to you, I'll think about it, I'll pray about it, I'll get back to you, that's probably never going to happen. I don't know why that is, but that's just how it seems to be. Uh, hope is the last thing that dies in a person when we give up hope. And once hope is gone, there's not a whole lot to live for. Uh, we need hope when the bottom falls out of our world. We need hope when bad things happen to good people. We need hope when sometimes God says no uh, to our prayers. And he's, you know, not obligated to say yes all the time. Uh, we need hope when God says wait, which is sometimes harder than the no. Is just hang on the way. Uh, the Bible's got a lot to say about hope. There's a couple of characters in the Bible called Abraham and Sarah that uh, they were interesting characters. You know, they, they, they believed God, they loved God and all, but uh, they were still human beings. And so um, in the book of Genesis, we find the story of the two of them who were both given a promise by the Lord that filled them with hope. It's a hope filled promise. Now Sarah was 65 and Abraham was 75 when the promise came, when God promised them a son in their old age. 65 and 75, right? And so basically God says, trust me, it's going to work out. So a year goes by, uh, nothing happens. Another 10 years, nothing happens. 
Then another 10 years, nothing happens. And Abraham's nearly 100 now, and Sarah was about 90. And God comes back to him and says, I'm still here. <laughs> and guess what? You're going to have a baby. And just, just wrap your head around that for a minute, you know? Abraham's response was really interesting in Genesis 17. The Bible says, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> I'm not sure that would have been my response at 100 years old. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll pass the oxygen. You know? <laughs> I don't know how I would react to that. You know, by the way, your wife is 90, is going to have your, your, your first kid. It's like, okay. Um, <clears throat> then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah? who is 90 years old, bear a child? I mean, asking God the question. Is this possible? Sarah's response is even funnier. Uh, in Genesis 18, Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in the years, the way of women ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself. Now, he, she at least didn't laugh out loud and fall on her face laughing. She laughed internally. And yet, guess what? God can see that too. And uh, she says, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you in about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But even though Abraham laughed with himself at the prospect of having a son in his old age, down deep in his heart, he still had hope in God. Romans 4 talks about that. It says, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. It talks about him not weakening in his faith. Uh, no unbelief made him waver. He grew strong in his faith, Paul says in Romans 4. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So how did Abraham and Sarah lay hold on the promises of God? Well, they had laid hold on them by faith. Hebrews 11 1 says, Now faith is the substance or the assurance of things all for the evidence of things not seen and so he was putting his hope and his faith in God what I think he did was he began to think theologically rather than logically now what I mean by that well logically the idea of Sarah having a baby at 90 years old is ridiculous it's crazy so what I mean that they began to think theologically well <clears throat> Logic, or logos, is the Greek word that means word, basically. Uh, theology means theo, which is God, and logos means simply words about God. And so rather than just thinking about words, they started thinking about words that God had spoken, okay? Rather than just what logic would tell them. Thinking theologically, if you will, is having your thinking aligned with the word of God. What God says, you choose to believe is true rather than the circumstances that are going on. He says faith is the assurance or the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, when logic tells us you'll never make it, you'll never find another job, you'll never be able to pay the bills, there's no cure for what you've got, the Word of God gives us hope. And when the devil whispers things like, you know, God's abandoned you or he doesn't care about what you're going through, he can't help you with that, or you've sinned too much, you're beyond God's forgiveness. The Word of God tells us, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you to the end of the age. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And if you confess your sins, He's able to forgive them and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I've learned about hope is that hope is something that we need to focus on a person rather than a nebulous thing. We need to have someone who cares for us to give us hope. Someone who's greater than we are. Someone who always keeps his promises. Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope. So here's Paul defining what God is like. One of God's attributes. He's the God of hope. He has endless hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now here's what this verse is saying. Here's God the supplier of hope, right? There's all the hope you'll ever need. Saying that he's willing by the Holy Spirit who lives in you to dump hope into your heart so that you may abound in hope. Not just have a little bit, 
Teens who need to help to get by, but you would have abounding hope. And that would be really cool, wouldn't it? To have that level of hope that, you know, rather than it's the half full thing, we see the positive side of everything. I, I work an acrostic uh, on hope because sometimes it's easier for folks to understand. And uh, this is my acrostic of H O P E, <coughs> what I believe hope means for me at least. And that is holding on with patient expectancy. Holding on with patient expectancy to the promises of God. Not to anything else, but to God's promises. Holding on with patience, patient expectancy. The hope that we have as Christians is as good as God's promises. And when God makes a promise, faith believes it, hope anticipates it, and patience quietly waits for it to be realized. Get that? Faith believes it, hope anticipates it, and patience quietly holds on quite the weights but to materialize, materialize. So you might say, well, that's all good and well, and you quote the story of Abraham and Sarah, they're giants of the faith, and they're the, the hall of faith, that's Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not that, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just a regular Joe, I'm just a, you know, blue collar worker, I'm just a, you know, son of the land or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm not one of these giants of faith. Well. Um, neither were Abraham and Sarah, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, here's what happened. Here's the full story. After all the great sayings of God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to bless the nations through you, I'm going to do all of that, it's my promise. Sarah loses patience with God. She gets fed up waiting for it all to happen and did what many of us do. She decided to try and help God out. Uh, by solving the problem herself. You ever done that? Yeah, you prayed about something that's just not happening and rather than wait for God to fulfill his promise to you, you, you try and engineer your own solution. And so my question is, how did that work out for you? Well, I know how it worked out for me every single time I tried to do that. I always ended in disaster. And so it did for Sarah as well. So she chose to give her servant, a girl called Hagar, to her husband, Abraham, and of course with the custom of the day, so they weren't doing anything illegal, so that Sarah could have a child uh, through her, through Hagar. And so Hagar conceives, and who's Hagar's son? A person called Ishmael. And so Ishmael's born, he became the father of the Arab the Muslim people. From the beginning, the descendants of Is Ishmael were a warlike people. They lived in hostility towards all the tribes around them. Genesis 25, 18 says that Ishmael was a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards his brothers. Here's what happens when you try and do stuff that God should be doing. You realize that problem is still with us today. It's never gone away. Get worse and worse. And that's, that is the root, brothers and sisters, of the problem in the Middle East. So you're going to blame anyone for that. Don't pick a politician. Blame Sarah and Abram for doing that. Conflict carries on today. It all began because Sarah and Abraham are unwilling to wait, unwilling to hope on with patient expectancy for the promise of God. They tried to hurry it up. And what happened? We see in the story that God works despite the misguided human effort. So God didn't back off from them and say, well, you did your own thing. You know, I'm not promising anything anymore. No, God made a promise and he kept his promise. And Abraham, Sarah did conceive and did have a child. You see, their faith and their hope were perfect, just like ours. Big names in the Bible. And they messed up. And so do we. We are not perfect in our hope. We're not perfect in our faith, but we're trying to get there. So if you feel you like faith, if you feel you like hope, then guess what? You're in good company. You're in good company. Hebrews chapter 6 gives us the kind of answer to some of the issues that we deal with with regards to hope. It says this, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, God can't do that. If God lied for one second, he would no longer be God. 
impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge may have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now what does all that mean? Jesus, when he died, went into the Holy of Holies, if you will, you know, in heaven, to present his blood before his Father for our atonement. He is now our great high priest. And the Bible says, what the writer of Hebrews say, is our hope is anchored to him. You know, we used to sing that old song, I'm anchored in Jesus, the storms of life are brave. We are anchored to the Lord. We are not out there just doing our own thing. We're not out there as glorified individuals. We're tied to the Lord through the anchor of hope. Back in the olden days, when a ship was coming into harbour and it couldn't navigate the narrows or the channels or maybe there were rocks or reefs or whatever, they would send a pilot ship out to guide it safely into the harbour. And what they would do is they would lower the anchor of the big ship, literally lower it into the boat, the smaller one, gently of course, into the smaller boat and that boat would be able to pull the big ship into safety. That's a, a really good picture that Paul paints in this particular text with regards to how we are anchored to the Lord that he can bring us safely home through all the difficulties and all the reefs and all the shipwrecks that may be around us and bring us safely because our anchor is in him. It's not the bottom of the sea, it's in a boat where he is carrying us into a place of safety. We have something to put our hope in the unfailing and written word of God. But more importantly, we have someone to put our hope in. And that's the living word of God. Jesus is our anchor. He is our sanctuary. He is our high priest. And as we navigate the circumstances of life, as we grapple the challenges that we face almost on a daily basis, we can hope that we can get through it. So is our hope this morning, the hope that says something like this, well, I, I hope things work out. Yeah, I hope it, hope it does. Or is our hope more of that theological kind of hope that's based on the promises of the Word of God? And I guess the big question for all of us, all the time, is who are we hoping in? Well, hopefully it's not the government. It's not the United States, as great as this nation is. It's not the world financial system, to make sure that we've got money in the bank. It's not the World Health Organization, to make sure we don't have another pandemic. It's not the only, any of these people. Our hope is in the Lord. As Christians, we need to make sure in these days that seem to be getting darker and darker, that our hope is getting stronger and stronger. Someone once said this, life without Christ is a hopeless end. But life with Christ is endless hope. Sometimes hope gets a bad rap. You know, there's a lot of preaching done about faith. There's whole denominations and movements of faith. Faith's a wonderful thing. It's so, so important. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But listen carefully. Hope is not like a second cousin of faith. Hope is right up there. Hope is a powerful thing. It's not a, a hope things will happen. It is a hoping in God. I'm putting my faith and trust in Him. Let's pray for Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for the hope that's set before us. Thank You, Lord, that we have hope in You. And whatever we're dealing with in our life, Lord, we thank You that You're always there. You're that friend that sticketh closer than a brother, hear what says. Help us to increase our hope, ever, have an ever increasing hope in you. That Lord, you will see us safely home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.